15. Isaiah 9 and verse 15. Please turn there with me if you have not already. Isaiah 9 and verse 15 as we open the Word of God together. Our topic again tonight is going to be prophets of the last days, false and true. Prophets of the last day, false and true. In the book of Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9 and verse 15, we're beginning our scripture study together. Are we there? Amen. Isaiah, 5, sorry, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15. The Bible says this. In Isaiah 9 and verse 15 it says, The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. Notice the next verse, which is mostly not taught. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Most times when we look at this passage of Scripture, for instance, we look at the only the 15th verse. And the 15th verse is used to, dis to discover truths concerning a prophecy. We're going to look at it in a moment. But when we look at this prophecy in the book of Isaiah, in its context, this idea of the ancient and honorable being the head and the prophet that, be, that is a teacher of lies, he is the tail. The context we see in the scripture is that the leaders of Israel, who Isaiah was giving woes, woes to the unrighteous, the leaders of Israel were causing and forcing and manipulating the thoughts and principles of the people that generally at one time understood the three angels' message, the first, second, and third, the judgment hour, a return to true worship, a fall of Babylon, what the beast, the mark, and the image is, what the reforms were that were necessary to meet Jesus in peace as they gave this message in all the world. All these things were changed. All these things were seen in a new context by a certain group. The Bible says they're leaders. We'll read it again. Isaiah 9 and verse 15, it says the ancient, old. And the honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Let's, let's examine some more scripture to see exactly how this can explain to us even the dangers of the last days that Jesus said very clearly in Matthew 24. Before we even go to Matthew 24, it, before we even go to Matthew 24, these decisions and principles of the last days that must be seen and made is given to us and fleshed out by these other scriptures. Isaiah 9, and verse 15 and 16, we see this idea of the ancient and honorable, and usually we go to this text after looking at Revelation 12. But now we want to go to Revelation 12 and see that in this context, what are we seeing when we talk about the leaders of God's people leading them astray or causing them, it says, to err when it comes to vision or err when it comes to the scripture. What are we looking at in the book of Revelation? Hold your finger there in Isaiah 9 and we're going to come back to that in a moment. In the book of Revelation it says this, Revelation 12. Hold your finger in the book of Isaiah 9 and we're going now to the book of Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 12, notice the context in which Revelation places this idea of the tale. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, beginning with verse Verse 3, I, uh, Revelation 12 and verse 3, we just read in Isaiah 9 that the Bible says, The ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. The meaning thereof is that the leaders of this people, the leaders of this people are causing the people to err. Err from what? Err from the instruction, err from the wisdom, err from the teachings that were given by the ancient men that were before their house. And the honorable men, even the prophets and the fathers and the elders that show the old past and the old ways that were good to walk in, there would be another generation or a group of leaders would arise, not ancient, not the honorable, but a new generation, a younger generation, not the old, a younger generation would rise, a generation that is thrown off the honor that was given to us when we had the truth, and this other generation would now take the truth and the past and the way that God said that we should go and give the people and cause and force them to go into another direction. God says these are the prophets that are unto a tale. In the book of Revelation it says this. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3 it says, Revelation 12, 3 it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his crowns, Sorry, and upon the seven heads, he had crowns on his head. Drop your eyes down quickly before we go to verse 4. Drop your eyes down quickly down to verse 9. Who is this dragon, it says here? In Revelation 12, verse 9, it says, Then the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Who is this great red dragon? It's speaking of Satan. Now what says this in verse 4? It says, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven 
and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Brothers and sisters, you know that this text of scripture, this passage, has another application. Another application. When we look at this scripture, this scripture deals with the coming of Christ and how the Roman government, under the illustration of Satan as a red dragon, Satan working through the nations, worked to attempt to destroy Christ as soon as the church was to bring him forth. Are you still following me? Amen. Christ was about to bring forth in the fullness of time a, 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 a manifestation of his humanity. We know that Christ, before he took on humanity, lived with the Father. Before the Father ever spoke upon this earth, the Father had his Son rejoicing before him. The Father and the Son were living and existing together in untold ages before. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But yet and still, the Bible said that he would take on a body, and that body would be humanity, our own humanity, the same as Abraham took partake of flesh, so he would partake of the same, and this would be manifested in a certain era of time. Prophetically, there were symbols and there were, were illustrations used in the prophet to show when this time was drawing near. The Bible says that this, this symbol, now this idea, is likened unto a woman, of course, being the church, Jeremiah 6, 2, Isaiah 51, being the church, going to give birth to Christ, not just Mary giving birth to Christ, but even the church giving birth through its humanity to this man-child. Now, when we look at that, brothers and sisters, we know that Rome, and often we look at Rome as playing its part in desiring to destroy Christ as soon as he was born. Amen? Amen. But I want to ask you a question. Was the church completely... Well, let's put it this way. We see the church or the woman giving birth to the man-child. But was the church itself completely guiltless when it came to the work of destroying Christ? Inasmuch as he who desired to destroy Christ was set over the church. Where was the church in all this work? We'll even think even broader. When we look at this application going beyond the centuries that brought us to Christ, the time when Christ came upon the earth, that time was a very, very momentous time, which is going to be and is being repeated in our day. When we look at this church bringing forth the man-child 2,000 years ago, the second application that we can see is also that God must bring forth in this final generation Christ through a people. The church of God must give birth to a remnant. Because when we look at this woman, this child would be her seed or even her remnant, remnant of her seed. Christ was likened unto a seed at that time. In the final generation, she's going to have the remnant or the last installation of this man-child, not a divine one coming down into humanity, but however, in truth a divine one because the Holy Spirit would come down into humanity and do the works through the 144,000. So you have Christ who took on humanity and was born of a virgin, and then you have a, another miraculous birth through, out of the church or from the church or from Protestantism or from God's church upon the earth. God would create an Advent people, a remnant people to do a final work. And just as it was then, so now there is a desire to destroy this people by Satan. By Satan. Was the church completely guiltless in the crucifixion of Christ? Was the church innocent? Could the church also wash its hands and say that they have nothing to do with this blood that's being spilled when Christ was crucified? Or was the church connected with the state in this crucifixion of Christ when he came the first time? Amen. Brothers and sisters, when we look at the work of Satan or the work of this tale that drew a third part of the stars of heaven, this work was continued upon the earth, even in destroying Christ, and it's going to continue to the end of time, even destroying his remnant people or the very elect, unless God would intervene through this Holy Spirit. God would use various means to get the work done. Brothers and sisters, was Christ crucified? Was Christ crucified? Amen. Christ was crucified, but was the work stopped? Was the work destroyed by Him being crucified? Or was the work finished by Him being crucified? In the book of Revelation, the Bible says that there will be some who will be martyred just as their brethren were. And they were told to rest a little while until that same martyrdom, that same uh, punishment, that same death is accomplished in these last day people. And through these deaths, they would also do a work to finish 
the work. There will be some that will give their life in these last days. And I want you to understand, when we talk about these last day scenarios, and even the idea of last day prophets, true and false, or false and true, we're seeing an idea that we see in the book of Isaiah chapter 9, where the Bible says that the ancient and honorable, he is the head. But the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. In the 12th chapter of Revelation, we see the church desiring as well as the Roman government in collusion to destroy Christ. And even though Christ was victorious and was gathered up to his father, in this last generation, the same scenario must play itself out. The same scenario must play itself out. And when we look at this idea, we as it was then, we as the people of God today are fain. We don't want to, we don't like to, we don't want to even, even give thought to the idea that such a thing could be. That persecution could break out among us and that we could, among each other, desire individuals in the church to be killed or destroyed or imprisoned for a true faith when Cain and Abel is relived again in this last generation. Brothers and sisters, when we look at this idea, in the book of Revelation, we're seeing that God said that the tail of the dragon was not just in heaven. The tail of the dragon swept a third part of the stars of heaven, and then he came to the earth with a deception and his, 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 his errors, and he came to do a work both in the world and in the church. And by doing that, he tried to destroy Christ. In his last generation, he continues this great controversy all the way down to the end, and he still has sneers and still has a desire to wipe that little company off the face of the earth. And when we look at this idea, brothers and sisters, we have to understand that when we talk about this idea of this tale, this tale that started this work in heaven, continued to the earth and continued to sweep stars. What do I mean by that? The Bible says very, very clearly that the stars in the book of Revelation are messengers per se. That's really in chapter 1. And we look at the book of Revelation and look at the seven churches. The Bible says to the angel of the church of Ephesus and Smyrna and Thyatira, all these various churches had angels. Are you still with me? Amen. Angels. And these angels were messengers or the preachers or those that were preaching the gospel in that age to be faithful unto God and to give the message of revelation or the revelation of Jesus Christ. If Satan swept literal angels in heaven, would he come to the earth also, and not only with the state, try and kill Christ, but he continue to sweep angels, or to bring individuals under his power, that they may not do the bidding and work of Christ, or the work of a true prophet, but the work of a false prophet. Are you still holding your finger in Isaiah 9? Amen. Hold your finger in Isaiah 9, we're going to the book of Timothy. Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. We go through these texts over and over again, but we want to see the context that we're bringing out tonight when we talk about this idea of last day prophets, end time prophets, true and false. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, do we see the same idea that in the last days, God's angels or his stars or his ministers might be deviated or taken away from their true standing or the standing that the ancient men, the pioneers, and the honorable men, the prophets of old, as it were, stood upon the foundation of truth, but there would be a new generation, another idea coming in the last days, and this new idea would not be the truth of God, but it would be through the sophistry or deception of Satan, they'd be drawn away from those paths that were good to walk in, drawn away from the landmarks, drawn away from the waymarks, onto another gospel, which is not another, but there would be some that would trouble you or even pervert the gospel of Christ. In the book of 1 Timothy 4, it says this, 1 Timothy 4, would this also, would the satanic work also, with this great controversy and the snare of Satan also affect God's remnant people in the last days? And when we look at the Bible, do we see that clearly? In 1 Timothy 4, who does it apply to? 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly with all clarity that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of who in the last days does this have application to? Is it just a people thousands of years ago? Or the people in the latter times, and even in our times, that will depart from the faith because of the tale of Satan sweeping them? And by that work, they also, like Eve, become a tale or a prophet teaching lies in the last days. What kind of prophet teaching lies? Isaiah 9 says, the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. They that are led of them are destroyed. When we look at the Word of God, we see this, this dynamic 
presented before us that we may understand how dangerous it is in these last days to trust any and everything that we hear. Unless we go to the law and to the testimony. It's in Isaiah. Let's look at that. Isaiah, to the law and to the testimony, how shall we know what truth is? In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter, chapter 8. Thank you so much. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20, it says this. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. The Bible says to the law and to the testimony. Where did the law and testimony came from? Where, the, where do we find the law and testimony having it as an origin? We know God, but it came through the prophets. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, giving unto us the law and the prophets. So the ancient and honorable is a source of the law and testimony. And the Bible says, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. It is because there is no light in them, even leaders that would cause the people of God in these last days to err. To bring them to the idea that women's ordination, though it's not really clearly outlined in the Bible, is a doctrine for the last days. Though even though we see clearly, that the Bible says clearly, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, that we need to change that language, because that language, even though we say, oh yes, it's scripture, but we want to bring another rendering of it to not try to make it seem as if, brothers and sisters, does the Bible seem or speak exactly what God wants to speak? Are men, women and men? Of course it is. Adam was man and woman. Both of them are called Adam, but the Bible says men. And when we try to start changing the Bible, but you know, some would say that's nothing. That's not, that's not a trivial thing. But you know why? Because we go through all these different translations of the Bible. You have the New King James and the NASB and the NIV and all these various translations have been tinkering and tinkering with the Bible for so long that now we come to the point where we want to change things in the church and make it gender neutral so that we're laying a foundation for where we really want to go. Oh, brothers and sisters, today we had a general conference session open and we had tremendous people, tremendous numbers of people, happy that Ted Wilson got back in, as if that is going to be a signal that God is with us. As if that's gonna be a sign that we're not continually on the local level, as well as the general conference level, being led to air. Brothers and sisters, was the great controversy given out? Has the great controversy been given out or has the great hope been given out? Which one? Has there been revival and reformation along the line the Bible and Spirit Party talks about? Has there been true city evangelism as the Bible and Spirit Party talks about? Or the great number of individuals that are leading the church that have constituency power, more so than the general conference president or the general conference, are those individuals, according to Isaiah chapter 9 verse 15 and 16, causing the people to err? You may have a desire to get out of the great controversy, but the leaders with constituency power desire to call the people to air. You may have a desire to have the Beehive Project come in and put city evangelism before the people, as Ted Wilson said in his dissertation for his doctorate. They might say, oh, this is the truth of God. However, the constituency power and the leaders of the church at the local and union and even division level are causing the people to go in another direction. And they have a different idea and mission and purpose. They say that they want to have their own autonomy and building and direction and money to do. Oh, brothers and sisters, the Bible says, ancient and honorable, he is the head. Ancient and honorable is the method by which we receive these truths. The ancient and honorable are the way that we receive the law and the testimony. The Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there's no light in them. Now, brothers and sisters, you might say that's a hard saying. You might say that's a hard saying. But you know what? I find it interesting that we don't find it hard when we say that about Protestants. We talk about the Baptist Church and the Methodist Church and the Pentecostal Church and the, 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 the Holiness Church. When we say that there's no light in them in preaching about the law of God and these very different things, we would feel gratified. We think it's right, it's true, and it's holy to say it about them. But then you have an Adventist minister that does not believe that the Sabbath is the seal of God, and if you say there's no light in him, now you're being hard. Now you're being divisive. Now you're being, you're being a, 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 your church bash. Brothers and sisters, which is it? Is it okay to say there's no light in them, but someone else preaches the same doctrine and there's light in him? And brothers and sisters, does the Bible not say that the light that we claim to have can become darkness? And the Bible says how great is that darkness so much so to cause the people of God to err? 
Brothers and sisters, do you understand the, the enormity of what we're seeing when we talk about these last days and these latter times where some shall depart from the faith? Let's even deal with that idea of the seal being the Sabbath. Is the seal of God connected with the Sabbath? Amen. Is the seal of God the Sabbath? Somebody say, oh, no, no, no. Because he said clearly that the Holy Spirit is the seal. Brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is the meaning by which we're sealed. If we don't understand, as a lot of us, as far as ministers, if we don't understand the teachings that God has given to us through the ancient and honorable, through the prophets of God, through the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, so all these various books and the ministers that gave it, and the pioneers of our faith, then we won't have an understanding of that. We will say the Sabbath is not the seal of God. We'll say what the first day people say. We'll say, oh no, the Holy Spirit is the seal. And they'll look at that because the Holy Spirit is the way that we're sealed on the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is a seal of our inheritance. And it's the Holy Spirit is the method by which we're sealed. But the Bible says very clearly in the book of Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, it says that we're going to be sealed by the Lord. Isaiah 8, Isaiah 8 and verse 16. Isaiah 8 and 16, it says, bind up the testimony. Bind up the testimony. Isaiah 8, 16. 8, 16 bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Seal the law among my disciples. So in other words, the law of God is connected with the sealing work. Yes, the Holy Spirit, but also the law. Now you say, how is this reconciled? Well, if we have the sanctuary truth, which most ministers today that are leading, causing people to go out of the path of truth and causing people to err, the erring is going in the direction opposite of the sanctuary. The sanctuary shows us, the method and principles of the foundation of our faith show us how the law and the spirit work together. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews very, very clearly that when God found fault with the children of Israel, he made a new covenant, a better covenant with better promises. And that covenant of promise was that he would write the law in their heart. Write the law where? In their heart. In their heart. Jeremiah said that writing of the law would be by his spirit. Ezekiel said the same thing. It would be through the spirit that this law would be written in the heart. Now, what law is the power of God? To write in our law, obedience to the truth. The Bible says in Psalm 40, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is where? Within my heart. With the law in our heart, we can do righteousness. With the law in our heart, we are fulfilling the new covenant promise. Why do people try and preach as if they're Baptists and first day ministers and they don't understand the most simple things about the new covenant promise or the New Testament religion and principle of the gospel? New covenant promise is the law of God written in your heart. Look at Romans 7 and see what law shows sin. Look at the book of Hebrews or even the book of James and see what law reveals sin and shows us what sin is. Paul said, I have not known sin except by the law. Because the law said, thou shalt not what? Covet. Thou shalt not covet. James said, when you fulfill the royal law, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. All these things were clearly outlined. This is the law that reveals sin and as it's written in the heart, it keeps us in right. The Bible says in Psalms, that all thy commandments are righteous. And when the Holy Spirit writes this upon the heart, then we're able to do God's law, we're able to preach the commandments, preach the truth, people are converted unto, uh, unto God, all these things are, are, real, re, are reality or realized under the ease and power of the Holy Spirit. And we understood this at a time when the ancient and honorable were among us, when the ancient and honorable were being preached and recited, and these teachings and truths were being preached from the pulpit. But there's another generation right, right there. There's another generation, the Bible says, there is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes. Their jaw teeth are sharp, brothers and sisters. Their jaw teeth, not the front teeth, the jaw teeth are sharp to destroy. Brothers and sisters, we are living in this time where we must be careful what we hear, because the ancient and honorable, or the method and source by which we receive the principles of God's word, have been removed. And we're not speaking according to these things. People will even confess that what they claim to have believed previously has been wrong. And this is a new understanding. Brothers and sisters, they're open and bold about it. But brothers and sisters, we will take that person because they have an ordination credential in their wallet because they are recognized by various conferences. We will look at that person as being true and righteous and valid when God looks upon them according to the spirit of prophecy as a fraudulent banknote. No light in them. And brothers and sisters, there is a need of repentance both intellectually and spiritually to stand back upon the platform of God. Are you there? Or are you among that great body, like in the time of Christ, being leavened by the leaven of Christ and Pharisees? Or are you in this other group that are upon the foundation trying to help build the temple of God, broken down. Are you among that group in Isaiah 58 that are building up the waste places 
and, re and fulfilling and, bring and, and doing this work of repairing the breach. What's that breach? It's the breach in God's law where we're taking our foot off the Sabbath and calling the Sabbath a delight. How can we take our foot off the Sabbath when we kick the Sabbath completely out saying it's not a part of God's seal? When the only law in the Ten Commandments that actually shows the name and territory and the actual title of God is the Sabbath. Oh, brothers and sisters, where are we? What's, what commandment else shows us righteousness by faith? Right doing by faith. Oh, brothers and sisters, are we in this last generation and being caused to err by those that have no light in them? Are we among those people that Jesus says in Matthew 24? Look at Matthew 24 now. Are we among those people that it says in Matthew 24 are in danger because we are surrounded by those that say they're coming as Christ? Remember, you had Christ literally coming in the book of Revelation 12. And then this other remnant of her seed or this other uh, development or this child, as it were, of the church of the last generation is the final generation. Again, let me repeat that. Look at Matthew 24. When we look at the book of Revelation chapter 12, the first child or man child we see coming in the very first chapter and very first words of Revelation chapter 12 is talking about in prophetic language the coming of Christ. The last portion of Revelation 12, after this woman flees out of the wilderness and is coming to this point where the dragon is making war with her, it says he went to make more war with the remnant of her seed. In other words, she had a man child, but there's a remnant of the seed now that's going to be in this last generation, keeping the commandments of God, having the spirit of prophecy, and these individuals, as opposed to those that are leading the people uh, to astray, these individuals are under aggressive warfare by Satan. It is as if there's another child, if it were, another offspring, another generation in the last days, just like Christ, that will be similarly attacked by the devil and his tail, or by the devil and his ministers, both civil and religious. We have often looked at it as being Roman Catholics and other Protestants in an in a, in a image of the beast, but when we look at the Word of God, we see clearly that Christ was not destroyed by Protestants per se. He was destroyed by those of his own denomination, his own faith. We must let our mind dwell upon these issues. We must see in Matthew 24, this danger that God spoke of through his son is very much present true to us today. It's showing us the danger of the hour that we live in. In the book of Matthew 24, it says this. In Matthew 24, Matthew 24 chapter, as a matter of fact, we can drop down to even the verse, verse four. Matthew 24 and verse four, it says, take heed that no man deceive you or lead you to err in the final generation. For many shall come, verse 5, in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Many will say, I'm of that final remnant group. And shall deceive what? Many. many. What's the deception? It's that tale that Satan had in the beginning that's come down to this last generation. Come through this great controversy, both in the world and the church. This deception is the work of Satan under the name of Christ, a name of religion, a name of Seventh-day Adventist, or whatever denomination it is, especially among us, we see this work in the last days. A profession of Christ, but the works of the enemy. It says in verse five, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Drop your eyes down. It says, in verse 23, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ. And false what? False what? False prophet. Doesn't the Bible clearly say in the book of Isaiah that the ancient and honorable he is the what? He. And the prophet that teacheth lies or deception, he is the? It says, there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall sow great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, how could they deceive the very elect? How could they deceive the very elect when the very elect have all these truths? Well, in the book of Job, Job speaks of the same final generation and the same work that's supposed to be done in the final generation and the same ministry that God wants to do through the Spirit, even in the hearts of his believers. And notice what it says in Job. Joel's prophecy was filling, or finding a partial fulfillment during the book of Joel. Joel's prophecy came to a partial fulfillment at Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up, Peter said that this prophecy of Joel had been fulfilled. Now, this fulfillment was only Pentecostal power. 
or early rain power. It was not the latter rain. And in Joel 2, it says this. Joel 2, beginning with verse 28. Joel 2 and verse 28. This is what is going to be the great deception. Brothers and sisters, when we look at the messages and work that's going on now, and the type of messages that are coming forth, there's a great idea among the prophets of our day, this new generation of prophets, this new generation that calls the people to air, that they have a strong belief, follow me, they have a strong belief that what they're doing and how they're doing it and what they're singing, how they're singing it, and how they're being moved upon to preach or to conduct themselves in the pulpit or in their ministry is under the power of the Holy Spirit. They believe that this movement is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit among Seventh-day Adventists. Or as Ellen White says, they will call all these things the moving of the Holy Spirit. And how will the Holy Spirit be moving in these last days, they say? Well, this Holy Spirit this power, these new truths that we have, this new idea concerning the things that we see clearly that we were wrong about, or the ancient and honorable were wrong about, these new ideas, or this new light that we have, is seen here. In Isaiah, sorry, the book of Joel, chapter 2 and verse 28, it says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall... Prophesy. Will these prophets only be men that are false prophets? This text is talking about God pouring our spirit upon true, prepared, spiritual people, giving the new covenant as well as the lettering power to both men and women. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, the deception must also be so similar that only by the scripture can we tell the difference. Because in this last days, will there mu or must there be also false prophetess among us? Women coming with also, because again, the devil said, it's not enough men to teach this foolishness. It's not enough men to try and tear down the foundation. We need to you know, sweep the bench and bring all the women in to preach this. Because they can sometimes out-preach this man with this foolishness that is being preached as truth today. We see that this deception must come both with men and women. There must be among the leaders, Isaiah 9, of this last day, this new generation, to call the people to air or to put away the ancient and the honorable, there must be women preachers. Women preachers doing this work. Brothers and sisters, women, according to Joel chapter 2, can be moved upon by the Spirit and preach the gospel. That's Bible. That's Joel. That's the book of, of John. That's the woman of the well. All through the word of God, we see that there were women that did faithful roles in doing the work of God. However, when we look at the idea of what we see in these last days and the calling the people to air, we know that Satan is a great counterfeiter. Isaiah says, the ancient honorable that he is the head, the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. The tail comes all the way down to the last generation. And this Joel 2 prophecy must also be counterfeited. It must also have a counterfeit. It must also have something that seems like it because what they believe, what the people that are at the forefront of this new generation and this new movement believe is that this is the moving of the Holy Spirit and that this, the singing and dancing, this, the pantomiming, this, the drums and the various different jazz chords that are being played, this, the, 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 uh, the ecstatic utterance and the neo-Pentecostalism, this, the, the Pentecostal preaching, this is revival and reformation, they believe. They believe this is the revival information that we have been waiting for, according to Joel 2, under the Holy Spirit, and we know it because men and women will be called and ordained to do this work, to preach this new gospel that turns its back upon the ancient and the honorable, which the Bible says shows them to have no light in them. Verse 29 says, I will also pour on my servants and upon my handmaids in those days, I will pour my spirit. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7 that upon the servants, God place his seal. And they believe that this seal of the Holy Spirit in talking in tongues, in his new music, in his new interpreting the doctrines would actually do away with the idea of a heavenly sanctuary, do away with the idea of an investigative judgment, or if they say they believe in a heavenly sanctuary, it's a, just a, 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 a legal belief in a heavenly sanctuary. Believe in heavenly temple, but the actual investigative judgment and the various t ideas of destroying sin in the heavenly temple as well as the earthly temple and the putting away of sins that are enumerated in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. Oh no, they don't believe that. 
because they believe that there would be no way they would have the drums and music they have. There would be no way they would have the type of dress endorsed and the wearing of jewelry and rings. There would be no way they would endorse these things that are completely contrary to the spirit and letter of the Bible and spirit of prophecy as a point of reformation, refor uh, reformation in the church. They would have a true reformation. But the book of Great Controversy tells us in the, under the chapter, Modern Revivals, that there would be among the people of God in the last generation a tremendous false revival. And that false revival will come first. Come will come first. And it will sweep away many. Did the people of God go into the, the promised land and then come to Baal Peor? No. Baal Peor, the serpents, coordinating the Bible, all these issues came up in the church to shake out those that at the base of Sinai had said all the Lord has said I would do. Those that heard the voice of God, heard the message, but in their hearts, only by fear, made a profession that they are Christ, but would deceive many. Those individuals, as the serpents came, as the harlots came, as the music came, as the apostles came, they were knocked off one by one by one. And their carcasses fell in the wilderness. And in a spiritual context, those carcasses were in the wilderness, but in the church, you have people that are spiritually dead in the wilderness while still sitting on boards. Spiritually dead, but still being elders as women, as men. Spiritually dead, but leading out of Sabbath school. Spiritually dead and doing all these types of work. May God help us in these last days to see with true eye cell where we are and what it means to reject the ancient and the honorable or those good and true righteous paths that were given to us by the prophet. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says that Jesus, as soon as he's ready to be delivered, was ready to be devoured by Satan using his instruments, using his ministers, both civil and religious, upon the earth to do this work. And we see the history in the story of Christ. We see this all throughout Revelation 12, this great controversy, the struggle between the truth and the true body of believers, humble and small as they may be, and these large religious and also civil institutions that are pitted against the forwarding of God's work. And God triumphs over and over and over again until we come to this last generation and we have a people now that want to turn away from the ancient, turn away from the honorable, turn away from the prophets and their example, turn away from the spirit of prophecy because their pastor says so. The teacher says so. And anyone out there that's been an evangelist or is an evangelist knows what it is to study with people and show them truth, Bible truth, and see the conviction upon their heart and their brow and to see them weep and desire to truly serve God and then go and talk to their pastor and feel bound by ministerial influence, by ecclesiastical pressure to serve man rather than God, serve their denomination rather than God. Is it so among us as well? for the leaders of this new generation that have rejected the ancient and honorable, Ellen White at the head of that group, are now leading the people to air? Are we now in that generation? Can we wrap our mind around such a truth that we are among those that are even in our denomination, among our so-called visible church, seeing these false prophets, male and female, even transgender, now coming to give a gospel in this last generation and trying to confirm it by the feeling they're having or the gift of tongues that they have or the, the idea that this freedom is the result of the Spirit of the Lord. The Bible said they will call liberty or turn liberty into license, license to sin. This is this Nicolaitan Adventism that has gone not beyond the borders of, of return, but is on the very verge of eternal ruin and taking others. The Bible says those that follow this, this practice or this new generation will be destroyed. Oh, brothers and sisters, the blind lead the blind. They both fall in the ditch. This last generation is now in the chapter Modern Revivals. They're now seeing this great revival that we were looking to see just in the first day churches among us. And we are so low to say that these individuals, what you call the one project, or all the other different types of spiritualistic 
and New Age Gospels, these new principles of doing Advent, or this recontextualizing of Adventism, which destroys the pioneers and Ellen White and clear Bible truth. These new ways are being made popular and itching ears are heaping together these type of ministers and they're calling it revival and reformation they're calling it the moving of the holy spirit they're calling it just as the spirit of prophecy said the spirit of god is moving in the last days will we be deceived the bible says in so much in so much that it was possible these things even among us even the rejection of the truth that we've had for almost 200 years would deceive the very elect. May God help us tonight as we study these things, as we examine these things, that we are on the verge of future votes at the General Conference session, which largely are going to continue down a trend. The re election of Ted Wilson may be, in some people's eyes, a, a sign of good things to come. But brothers and sisters, we're told in the spirit of prophecy that nothing will be allowed to stop this new movement. Nothing will be allowed to stop this new movement. It's only those, Ellen White says, among the common people, where God's going to start a revival, they're going to go and lead the plow and lead the, 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 the field and go out and do this work under God, under the true movement of the Holy Spirit, not under umbrellas, not under institutions but by the power of the Holy Spirit, by taking through digital means like this, messages and putting them free of cost, absolutely free on the internet so they can have God's hand move them. God will give it a thousand views, five thousand views. God will give it ten thousand views. God will get it before the people. God will get it in the homes. People will send funds to help forward the work and to gather more ministers, to gather more sites like this so that the digital church will be one of the simple means God would use to perfect his work in righteousness. Unless, unless, brothers and sisters, We've gone so blind by the airing that we have been pressed upon by these new leaders. The tail has swept us to our own destruction. Brothers and sisters, may God help us to have that eye salve that we speak of in the book of Revelation, that gold and white raiment. We, brothers and sisters, we need that spiritual discernment that we can truly, not just with our lips, but with our heart and our mind, see to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not these words of the ancient and the honorable. If they d deny the spirit of prophecy and the Bible, even under the idea this is the Holy Spirit moving, there's no light in them. How shall we understand these things? How shall we organize ourselves? Where shall we go if our local church is an apostasy? Many have been so long outside the idea of true Christianity, they don't have any worship in their home. They don't have any home altar. They don't have any idea of bringing people into the Bible study. They only understand what the leaders give them. The ancient and honorable, the ancient and honorable men endorsed and supported and ordained and set up studies in people's homes. They built an altar in everyone's home. They taught people to have home devotion and worship. There always was a church in the home. So that if anything happened, they continued to go on. But now, this new generation, everything must be under the umbrella. It must be under the NAD, under the General Conference, whether liberal or conservative, and both in these last days, whether you believe it or not, are leading the people to destruction. We must arise and shine, brothers and sisters, because though darkness prevails upon the land, our light has come. The time is here. It's time to awake. Zion must awake. We must trim our lamps and start studying the Word of God, going through our Bibles, going through the Spirit of Prophecy and understanding in those conflict series what the message is and understanding in those testimonies, those nine volume testimonies, exactly how to do this work, how to do a health work, how to do a preaching work, how to do a development of an institution, how to do ministry work, because we need to know the time is at hand. Tonight has God moved upon your heart to see something that you never saw before or to understand the danger where we are. Can you see how dangerous it is to just let your children go to any Sabbath school? To attend any church? To send Bible study contacts you're going to any church? Whether they call themselves present truth or self-supporting or whatever they call themselves or conference. It makes no difference, brothers and sisters. We're not just talking about conferences, brothers and sisters. We're not just talking about conferences. We're talking about conferences, unions, divisions. We're talking about self-supporting, independent. We're talking about all from the left to the north to the right to the south, every direction. To the law and to the testimony, brothers and sisters. They speak not according to this word, 
There's no light in them. Let me God help us understand what that means in these last days and discern on this time where God is pouring out His Spirit to raise up preachers, to raise up prophets, that we can understand last day prophets true and false. Father, we ask the Holy Spirit to do His work in our hearts. We need the third person of the Godhead to do His mighty work in our hearts. We need conversion. Some of us do not have a spiritual hold on God. God has been showing and revealing it to us time after time. Time after time, He's shown us that we don't have control of our emotions, we don't have control of our temper, we don't have control of the things that God said that we have peace in. He says, My peace I leave with you. Not as the world give it give unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither to be afraid. Because out of the heart comes foolishness, blasphemy, adulteries, theft. Those things must be destroyed. Those things must be kept in surrender to God. How shall we do this without the law being written in our hearts? And how shall we receive this if we're going to individuals that do not understand or believe that gospel? They don't believe the everlasting gospel. They don't teach and preach about the true principles of conversion because they don't understand these methods. They don't teach the sanctuary and the investigative judgment as being present truth because they don't see, the, they don't understand this judgment hour everlasting gospel message. How shall we be prepared to stand in our lot and do the work if we're sitting under leaders or following leaders that are leading us not to the promised land but to destruction? Lord, help us, like in the time of John the Baptist, to see that God is setting up a highway for the righteous. God is trying to make straight the path of the Lord that Christ may come. He's trying to ready a people for Christ's soon return. Lord, prepare us Strengthen us as you did through John. Prepare us and strengthen as you did through Jesus. Prepare us and strengthen us as you did through the disciples. Even a three angels message that we might understand this work that was largely done. Largely done. Not under the control of any institution as a template for our last day work. We will understand these things whether we see it now or when the, the storm and tempest sweeps away the structure and we see it at the 11th hour before we eternally lose our soul, Lord, help us that we, if we are willing, would see these truths and start to shake ourselves, to wake up, to trim our lamps, and find our way into the most holy place. For it's ever too late. For we ask all these blessings, thanking you, believing in you, receiving your cleansing and forgiveness in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight.